Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to the World <clears throat> Creativity and Innovation Week. I'm joined here by Mr. Pat Moffitt. Uh, he is, his presentation is called Caring for the Caregiver. And Pat Moffitt married the first love of his life, Carmen, in 1976. And together they raised five children. In 1998, Carmen was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. After years of struggling, the disease took her life. Following her death, Pat wrote Ice Cream in the Cupboard, a book based on his and Carmen's love story and its tragic turn. He later produced the internationally acclaimed film based on the book. Today, with the huge support of his second love of his life, his wife Marlene, Pat works to raise awareness about early onset Alzheimer's and to support family caregivers. So what we wanted to do now was actually play the trailer for the movie. So bear with me just a second. And oops, I'm going to share that. What year is it? 2016. And what is your address? I have no idea. That's OK. How many children do you have? Two. And who brought you here today? My husband, Pat. It feels like we are slipping away from each other. There is nothing I can do. And it's not fair because I need you. I can't go through this without you. So Pat, yes. that looks so interesting. So yes. I'm going to go ahead, oops, and let you take, oops, let you take over and talk about your uh, experiences. Well, uh, I think everyone, uh, I'm often asked, what was your inspiration for writing the book and then ultimately doing the movie? And um, the uh, inspiration is very simple. My wife is a very loving woman. She was young, she was just 53 years old when she started showing the signs uh, of Alzheimer's. And the way that happened was a shock to me. I was only 49 years old, four years younger than, than she was. And we seemed to be bickering a lot as, as husband and wife, but there was something underlying that I couldn't put my finger on that was, just seemed to be more anger on her part about everything. And uh, so I said, you know, maybe my wife is Puerto Rican, I said, maybe we should just go to Puerto Rico. Let's have a nice romantic weekend and relax. Maybe we're working too hard. We're on each other's case all the time. And uh, so she was okay with that. And we went to Puerto Rico and got there in the afternoon. And we were just, uh, she didn't seem right on the plane. She wasn't talking very much. And we got to a restaurant that night. And uh, there was a kind of a two-story veranda. And I was looking, we had just ordered steak and lobster. And I was just looking over the railing, admiring the cars, 52 Chevy, 57 Ford, you know, cars where it seemed to last so long down there. And um, I turned my head back to look at her and she hit me in the face with the entire plate of steak and lobster and then ran out of the restaurant. So I was on the floor, I hit my head on the table behind me, the people picked me up and they wouldn't even, the waiter wouldn't even let me pay the bill. He said, no, just catch up to your wife. She ran out of the building. She's running down the main drag, Ashford Avenue in uh, San Juan, and I'm running after her, and then I realized the police are following me. Like, what's the six foot three Irish guy chasing this five foot Puerto Rican woman down the middle of the street? And we kind of stood out. And I caught up to her, and the same time the police got there, and I said, he said, what's, what happened here? And I said, she just had a little bit too much to drink. You know, we had nothing to drink. I was just trying to figure a way to get out of the situation and calm everything down. And um, she seemed to be calm at that moment. And I was able to get her in a taxi. The police said it was OK. And we went back to the hotel. And she laid down in the bed. And this is like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night only. And um, she went to sleep. And I went out on a terrace. And I had three of the fastest beers I've ever drank in my life. 
I was shaking. I had no idea what this experience was about. There was something so unusual about it. And she walked out on the terrace and about 30 minutes later and I was still sitting there. And she said, um, honey, when are we gonna eat? I'm really starved, you know, you need to feed me. And I said, well, I tried that and you threw your food at me. And she said, now that's ridiculous. You joke around too much. I don't never throw your food at you. I said, well, look at my shirt. It'll cover with A1 sauce bits, all, all kinds of stuff. She says, I didn't do that. You're blaming that on me too. You know, so this was just shocking. So I felt the best thing to do was to get out of there in a hurry. So we were on the plane the next morning. I had to get back to New York. And I, I called the kids and I told them what happened. They says, wait a minute, let me, let me get this straight. That Mom hit you with a plate in the restaurant and you guys weren't even arguing. You didn't do anything. Okay. And, and that's how this happened. I said, honest, that's, that's it. I don't know what else to say. So a couple of days later, she was starting to get a little calm, but she was just seemed to be off base. And we went food shopping. And uh, we came back and she always put the food away. And I went out and I went to the dry cleaners. And I came back from the dry cleaners and I saw a liquid coming out of the bottle of the pantry, of the bottom of the pantry. So I, I opened up the cabinet and I was looking to try to find the source of this liquid. And sure enough, when I got to the top, I moved the cans aside. There was a deflated box of Breyer's vanilla ice cream, you know, her favorite. So I said to her, I mean, I said, I think you put the food away at like lightning speed today because you put the ice cream in the cupboard. And she said, I didn't do that. Why don't you blame those kids upstairs? You know, you blame everything on me. They'll leave me alone, you know, getting angry and angry again. There were no kids upstairs. Nobody was living there but us two. So it was like she was going back in time. And uh, up to this point, she refused to see a doctor saying there was something wrong with me and absolutely nothing wrong with her. So, and within a few days, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I said to her, uh, I'm just thinking to myself, if I have to put her in the trunk of the car in a net and get her to a doctor, I have to do something. We can't just live our life like this. Something is terribly wrong. And, and of course, Wendy, you never in a million years will be thinking Alzheimer's. That's just, you know, the thought would never enter. I would think of a thousand things before that. In any case, um, she came home from work about, uh, about three days later, and I was setting up my plan on how to get her to a doctor, and she said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And so we sat down, and she said, I have a touch of Alzheimer's. I said, a touch of Alzheimer's. Isn't that being like a little bit pregnant? Either you have it or you don't. And she said, yes, I, I have Alzheimer's. And I, she, I asked her what had come about. And she said, well, I've been making a lot of mistakes at work. She was the budget administrator in the elementary school about six blocks from our house. And what was happening there was she was a head of purchasing as well. So she was, uh, she ordered um, this uh, glue for arts and crafts for the children. So they make their little drawings and what have you and pasties and so, um, and she ordered 10 cases of airplane glue. And they saw that on there and I said, well, you're the one that made the mistake. It's not the company misdelivering it. They asked her about the budget. She said, I don't know anything about a budget. Meanwhile, she was the manager of the budget. She had completely forgot what her job was. And then when I spoke to the school, they said, well, we had a couple of bad incidents on top of that. One being a mother called and said, don't send my daughter home today on the bus. I'm coming to pick her up because there's no one at home. So I'm coming directly with my car and I'll drive her home. Well, of course, that was common. She was speaking to, she hung up the phone and that call never existed two seconds later. The child was sent home on the bus. And that was a bus where the kids just went in the house and the bus took off, a little more than we have today where kids are meeting their parents and stuff like that. And this girl just sat on the front steps till a neighbor saw her and said, you know, I don't know where her mother is. And, you know, wound up calling the police and trying to reach the woman. and. You know, it was a big deal. And then they realized that the call came into Carmen. And so they, what the school said was, Carmen, you're either going to have to go for an exam and find out if there's something wrong with you. If not, we need to fire you for cause. And we don't want to do that because if there is something wrong, you have to be treated for it. You at least get support from the state of New York. You know, you'll still have your, your, your benefits uh, from the state. At least you have an income. But you can't work here anymore. And that's the day she was diagnosed and spoke to me about it. And, and so that, that, that began this 
tremendously long journey uh, into um, this uh, crazy, crazy world. And so one of the things that I, I try to do that these violent cases are, they crop up in a lot of different places. And I, I take people out to one, well, before COVID, I took people out to dinner, um, uh, caregivers, early onset, all in their like 50s, some in their 40s, a couple of men were 45 years old. And um, just try to get them out to relax for a night, sit down, have a drink at the table. Then they start to meet each other, the caregivers, and then they kind of set up their own little support group. Uh, and of course, you know, with Facebook, everybody got into that. We didn't have that a long time ago. You know, uh, I didn't even have a support group because I, I went to one and, and I said, hi, my wife is uh, 53 and, and they just stopped talking. Everybody's spouse in this place was 70, 80, 90 years old. And I was clearly in the wrong people. They we had nothing in common except the forgetfulness of the disease. So uh, I had to get out of that. Then that's when I began to think, well, what, what would I do? What are these people doing now? I don't think much has changed. And so I got together with a couple of social workers that I knew, and we started this group called Let's Do Dinner. And uh, we want, made sure that their um, loved ones were being professionally watched. So this way they can clear their head and sit down and discuss their cases. They were among friends and they would just enjoy, we got a private room in a restaurant that were very nice to us. So it was, it was quite a thing and, and they just loved it. And unfortunately, their loved one would pass on at some point. We did it for a number of years. And uh, of course they would have to exit the group then. Um, but uh, that's how we got these things started. And then we hit with uh, COVID and, you know, we had to really kind of stop everything because our world changed, as you know. But the, um, the uh, real uh, inspiration here, and I, and I might have mentioned before, common two sisters and her brother were also stricken in their 50s and died in their 60s. So, so that indicates really, when it, first of all, that's a rare mutation of Alzheimer's but it clearly indicates it's genetic. That's, that's the sign right there. And of course, I was very young. I'm just learning my way through this. And um, as I, 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 I uh, Kwame's father, Kwame's mother was, uh, died of um, uh, ovarian cancer and she was very lucid up until the time she died. And uh, she knew everybody and uh, no one, nothing unusual about her. Uh, and then I, uh, her father died of uh, cirrhosis of the liver is what Carmen had told me. So I got a hold of one of the elderly aunts in North Carolina. She, Carmen was raised kind of on Fort Bragg for a very good time after they left Puerto Rico. And I said, you know, can you tell me anything about Emilio, who's Carmen's father? And she said, no, he was uh, drank all the time, every day. And I said, how about his behavior though? I mean, I know he drank a lot or, Maybe he fell down or something. Was there anything unusual about his behavior? And this Ann said, well, Patrick, I can tell you one thing. He went out to lunch one day. He was a cutter in the Gorman Center in Manhattan. And he went out to lunch several days and couldn't find his way back to the office. They sent out people for looking for him. And he was in the bar. He was just floating around the streets, not knowing where his office was. And just that story alone, that made the connection to me. And then he couldn't find his way home. They sent the sisters out, the daughters out looking for him. And I said, there's the connection. So he was born in Spain, migrated to Puerto Rico, married Carmen's mother. And then they came uh, to stateside. And, uh, and that was where that, everything started. So it began on the father's side, which can happen at any time. You know, we know, but that's as far as I can track down the genetic part. So the, as we know, as, you know the, uh, the caregivers, um, let me give you some examples. And these are very recent things. In the um, in state of uh, Washington, a, uh, and this is how when I, when I say the caregiver has to, you know, has to get some help, has to get a break, um, has, to be, has to be a part of a, a team. They can't do it alone because bad things happen. So there was a man that his wife had Alzheimer's. They were kind of reclusive. They had a, uh, a fairly nice home, but in the woods, they weren't in touch with anybody. They just kept to themselves. And uh, as it turned out, uh, the, the wife had Alzheimer's. She was about 71. And uh, the husband uh, was okay, but he was taking care of his wife and that's the way he wanted it. 
And then he took a terrible fall down a flight of stairs that knocked him out completely and actually in the end gave him a fractured skull. But he didn't move from the floor. And the wife didn't know how to call anybody. So she didn't do anything. She just climbed over him and went about her business around the house. She didn't know how to dial 911, you know, nothing. The next day after that, they had a housekeeper that came to the house and found the father dead on the floor because he did not receive any treatment. And then the case that um, uh, in um, Long Island, a uh, car crash took place on this Northern State Park Ring about 10 o'clock at night and it was a man about 51 years old. And um, as far as they could tell, he lost control of the car. He was killed in the accident hitting a tree and uh, there were no uh, traces of drugs or alcohol or anything in the system that would have impaired him. And, uh, and I read the story in the paper, it was, it was a big story here. And about three days later, I was contacted by a woman that said, Mr. Roberts, don't you work with Alzheimer's people? And I said, uh, yes, yes, I do, with caregivers and that. And they said, did you read about that man on the Dixie Dean Parkway the other night that was killed? And I said, yes, I read that story, it was very sad. You know, She says, well, I wanted to let you know. He was a caregiver for a 50 year old Alzheimer's patient. That was his wife. And he hadn't slept more than maybe two hours in three days. She says, we tried to keep him where he was so he could stay with us and just sleep in. And he insisted upon going home and, and his wife was with them, but he insisted upon going home and just being by himself. You long for that, that time that you're by yourself. It's very, very important. And he fell asleep at the wheel. That has to be the answer because he made that trip a hundred times. And so there it is, a, you know, you know, so the, the losing control of the car and hitting a tree caused his death. But what else was behind it? It was Alzheimer's. You know, this is eventually ran the caregiver down. It was what happens to them, Wendy. The immune system starts to fail and they come then with all kinds of things. So that's what, you know, when you don't, you're not acting like the right same person that you are. Heart attack is very big because it's so hard to keep up with the patient. When you have an elderly, uh, Alzheimer's is bad on any level, but when you have a, a you know, person that's in one of the elderly sides, say 85 or 90, um, they're not going to have that strength to throw something at you, to run out of a door. They might be in a wheelchair, they might be in one chair all day kind of thing. So they just don't have that power. My wife, you know, was five foot one, maybe 110 pounds. She's great physical condition. And uh, this is why that the caregiver gets so run down and can't keep up with them every day in and out without getting some kind of a break. So that, that was that was pretty important then uh, the, the car crash thing. And um, then the, the most recent one um, was in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And in March 3rd up here in the Northeast, uh, in Allentown or in Pennsylvania, they had 27 inches of snow. And I was on Yahoo News and I was just paging through a couple of things the day after the storm was over. And the headline said, woman with Alzheimer's dies in snowstorm. So of course, this, uh, I got right into that story. And as it turned out, the woman got out of her house um, I don't know a lot of details about the caregiver that might have been with her. Maybe it was her husband. But of course, he could have been sleeping. His wife got out of bed, just thought she was going to the bathroom. And I said, you go into this deep sleep and you can't, you're, you're just so exhausted. You may only get three hours and then you're at it again. She got out of the house, walked about eight blocks from the house in really blinding windy snow, completely lost where she was, lost her bearings and just laid down in the snow, was covered with it and died of hypothermia, 67 years old. Now, the call came into the police department at 4.12 a.m. in the morning. I think that's, I'm guessing a little bit here, but I think this is when the caregiver woke up and realized she didn't come back from the bathroom or something along those lines. And uh, that's why, and then the police found her at 9.30, she was already dead. So that's how fast this happened. So here is, the caregiver not getting much help again, making an assumption that, you know, it's so snowing so bad out, she wouldn't go out in the snow. And that's exactly when they're gonna go out. And that's why I kind of call early onset Alzheimer's, it's like a light switch when events happen. 
was getting out of that bell, getting out the door, probably never even put on a coat. They don't know enough to do that. She was a, she was a moderate case. They don't know enough to do that. She might have been in her pajamas, which further added to the hypothermia. You just had no covering on at all. And, and this is why, again, another case of now, now the patient died because maybe the caregiver didn't get enough rest or didn't get some help. Or somebody didn't spell him and say, hey, you know, you want to stay in my house tonight and I'll go stay with mom and that sort of thing. So that's why they always need this kind of uh, uh, care and some backup and things like that. And um, you know, a woman here on the on Long Island with her husband had Alzheimer's and he's about 55 years old. And, and he, uh, she drove him to the strip mall. So I gotta go to the store, I gotta pick up one quick thing. So she left him in the car, right? She ran into the store, she left the keys in the ignition. He got behind the wheel, stopped the car and drove away and had a really bad accident and was hurt bad. He wasn't killed, he recovered okay. But you know, there's something that a woman that, she would have never normally done that. I always would have taken my keys, but you're, the caregiver is just not themselves all the time. So that's a little story about that. And, and, and that's why I'm, I'm all, you know, very concerned about these caregivers and, and, and getting them help uh, and where the family has to join in. The family has to join in. The caregiver has to have that, the wherewithal to say, you know, especially men, uh, the recent uh, gentleman that had a heart attack right here on the lawn that I knew with the family very well, they feel this need, as his brother was a close friend of mine, but they feel this need that this is my wife. We've been together all our lives. I can protect my wife. I can take care of her doing this disease. No one's going to, you know, push me around. And I'm, I'm you know, and he and quit his job. I always tell everybody, don't quit your job. You're going to need it. You're going to need income because this scene is going to change. And then you're going to have nothing. And you're going to still going to be a young person, man or woman. And I said, Rick, your brother is going at such a pace that he's going to have a heart attack. He looks terrible. Okay? And the guy wouldn't hear it. Five days later, he had a heart attack. Fortunately, he was able to get his phone out, call 911, a neighbor came over and so on, and he was safe. But the day he was released from the hospital and came back, the first thing he got was a caregiver, a professional, and paid the money. These are very expensive things. Um, I, had a, I had a caregiver, and this is the way you make mistakes. Uh, by learning, especially when you're my age at that time. I had a uh, caregiver that, that was recommended by a professional organization. And I said, okay, great. And the woman came in and she's very nice and she had worked with Alzheimer's patients before. And I said, okay, this is wonderful. And um, she brought these games that were good for uh, keeping your mind busy and that. And I said, oh, this is really cool. She knows what she's doing. And um, we, uh, uh, I, a couple of days after that, she was working in, in, in the house she was at. I went to work and I came home a little bit early and I'm driving down the block and there's my wife Carmen talking to a construction job guys, digging a hole in the ground. And I'm, I'm looking around for the caregiver, wasn't around. We're with, so I, I got out of the car and I said, listen, gentlemen, I'm sorry. This is my wife and she has Alzheimer's. He said, oh, we're so glad to see you because we were going to call the police. We didn't know what to do. She seems like such a nice lady. And she's dressed so nice and everything. It was just odd for us. I said, believe me, I live a life of odd. And with that, the caregiver comes running around the corner. She was overweight, not in very good physical condition, went to the bathroom and calm and took off. Knew how to open up the door and out she went. That's when things get really bad. They don't know a red light from a green light. They may just walk in front of traffic. So that's what I, I remember that. Now, okay, next caregiver, you know, I have to get one that's in good condition. But what happened was with the, the violence in Carmen's case, she beat up the caregiver, uh, the housekeeper that we had all along, she knocked her around. Both of these people came to me and said, Mr. Moffin, I'm sorry, I, I can't stay here anymore. It's just dangerous. She tried to throw me down the stairs the other day. This is while I was working. So, no, so the word got out and there was no caregiver would take care of my wife. So in, in the Long Island Jewish Hospital out here in, uh, in near Great Neck, they have a, a daycare center for Alzheimer's people. And so I got, was able to get Carmen into it. And I said, okay, it was, it was incredible, very expensive, but this is something I wanted to keep my job and we'll pay for it. This is, I, I was warned that this was going to be draining uh, financially, but it was a place that I knew they took care of people. It was a beautiful facility and all. And she was there, I think maybe two weeks and they called me and they said, you better come over here. We need to talk to you. 
So if you come right now, it'd be great. So I got my car and went there at the facility. And they said, Carmen punched out a 90 year old man today and bruised him pretty bad. And I said, oh boy. Um, so they said, we want to be able to let you know that, you know, you're the primary caregiver and you're the husband and we and you can be sued because your wife did this damage to another man like this, another person. You're responsible, you know, for the liability. You have a liability with us. And I said, oh, this is all I need. It was a lawsuit now. And wife was just a total mess. And uh, fortunately, the family of the man that was there, they understood, you know, they were shocked to see Carmen's case and they didn't take any action. But this is what you come down to. And eventually she had to be tested for um, antipsychotic drugs. Um, and uh, they said, we're gonna do this mixture and see what works. She has to stay in the hospital for three weeks and we will monitor her 24 seven. And we'll see which drugs she has reactions and, and, and mom said, okay, great. And hopefully you take a, a calmer wife home. I said, okay, good, let's do it. And they said, it's good for you to take a break too. So about three and a half weeks later, um, they sent me and said, okay, you can come on, come on, come on down. And I said, okay. And I uh, sat down and the, uh, the three doctors came in and they said, Mr. Mulvin, these three drugs, which we were used that work somewhat, that keep her calm to a degree, they can't be administered at home. They're much, much too dangerous. You can't administer it for sure. What we feel is that if you took her home and she had a convulsion a month from now, we don't know how long they're gonna work. Her case is so severe. She, she goes into a convulsion, you call 911, medic's gonna come? They're not gonna know what to do. They're, they're not gonna understand any of this. So that's why she needs the 24 and seven care. And that was that was the last time my wife ever came home. She never came home again. So that was the, uh, that was the end of the line. And, and I became a visitor to a nursing home from, from then on. And that's pretty much my, uh, my story. Uh, so you have wow. any questions or anything? I do, I do actually. Um, and actually Christina in the, in the quick Q and A, she asked a question. Uh, so I thought I would ask that here. She said, what type of doctor and special background is best to look for help? Uh, to help test and make diagnosis in the very early stages when you're just beginning to suspect that something is off? Yeah, at, at, uh, at any uh, level, the neurologist is the key doctor. He's the one that will do the diagnosis. And that diagnosis is important because it'll have to do with healthcare and things like that. So it has to be an official diagnosis. So the neurologist, uh, if you want to start with your family doctor, that's fine, but you're going to get the recommendation from your family physician on who's a neurologist. That's the, that's the key doctor. And so as I'm listening to your story and you're telling it and you talk about the difference, uh, you know, so with somebody so much younger, this early, the early onset Alzheimer's, yes. why does that seem so much more, uh, well, violent in, in Carmen's case, but so much more drastic, so much more disruptive? The, the patient really uh, is uh, building up inside as a frustration that's building up because they can't do things. This is why she insisted on staying in the school, even though she ruined the budget and ordered things wrong. And people were telling her, what are you doing? You know, all that builds up. You feel like a complete inadequate person. And then when you're home and, and that's it, then, then they want to, somebody always wants to help you. You can't do that. No, you, you have to leave your checkbook alone. That's so good. We'll handle that for you kind of thing. And then they get angry at this thing and it builds up. And that's when they last out. So when Carmen's case, it was so odd because there was nothing really going on except her and I arguing at home. And I tried to solve it with a case in Puerto Rico and was, you know, nearly knocked out. You know? So that's, that's the case. So they get very frustrated in what they can't do and that they were familiar with, you know, at one point in time, it came easy. Now it's a nightmare. So for your particular case with her, um, you didn't really notice, she, she obviously didn't share with you that things were happening at work. So she kept no. that under wraps. But you, work, until, no. until your trip to Puerto Rico, you really hadn't noticed anything? No, not at all. No, I, uh, she was working, coming on the same time. Uh, she was getting a little forgetful on a couple of things here and there. You know, I said, you know, come you know where that is. It's over there and, you know, that sort of thing. But nothing that would really knock you over. You know, we're figuring, well, we're getting older. That's just going to happen to everybody. That's how, I know people that are 20 years old can't remember things. So I didn't really take that as any particular strong sign. 
So I, even both, even when I got hit in with the plate, I didn't never made the connection of the two anyway. So that's why I said when I came back and all this happened, then I started to think of that. And I thought Corman's case was a record at 53. This must be a world record. Meantime, I was so far off from that. It's not even funny. Uh, our case, our youngest case on Long Island, I was a man, got it at 32 and died at 43. So I went, oh my God, you get this at that. I sat on a panel in Puerto Rico with the Alzheimer's Society International representing the United States. And, and uh, I happened to say to the director of the facility in, uh, in Puerto Rico, I said, by the way, what is your down here? What is your, your youngest case? He says, well, we have uh, two actually that are very young. One's 28 male, one's 29 as a woman. Uh, they both had two children and the children have to be removed from them because they were violent. You know, so you, you hear some of these numbers and they're staggering. But without these caregivers getting some help, someone's going to get hurt, bad or die. And that's why I've devoted my advocacy that I want to do for the rest of my life. So well, the film and yeah. The, yeah I no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's just that, you know, this is what I, I could do. I, I bump into someone on an airplane. Uh, I was an author. We, I was on doing my regular job in business before I retired. And we both happened to be authors and we were talking and we exchanged books. And, and when he read Ice Cream in the Cupboard, he called me up. He said, this, this is a movie. Oh, my God. I can't believe this. He said, I was shocked. I read it twice in the same day. And uh, he said, you know, I got a couple of people I know. Maybe they can help you. Out. This looks like a film. And that's how we got started. That was it. No, oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. You Use never know. Are you going to retire? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Right. Right. Well, that's amazing. Um, Christina followed up her question to see, to ask if Carmen was ever able to communicate what she was feeling. Uh, she would do, she would say things at times, like, you know, but it was, there were more sad things, but she would say, um, I feel my life is, is slipping away from you. And, and sometimes you're sitting next to me in the chair and I sometimes don't realize that you're there. You know, the comments like that. And then she would surprise you. And, and uh, we watched Jeopardy quite a bit. And she loved Alex Trebek. We all did. And at that time, she would always say, you know, she came up with a, an answer to one of the questions uh, about Daphne du Maurier, the author on the book called French Two Tenants Woman. That who wrote that? And she said, who is Daphne du Maurier? And she was right. You know, and I was saying, how does this work? This disease, you know, how do you remember something like that? And when she was in nursing care, um, I sat with her on Sunday. We were watching TV. I was holding her hand. Okay, she was really talking just gibberish at this stage. But she had a new medication that had come out that sent off little sparks, but I didn't know about the medication. They hadn't told me about it yet. And she just looked at me and she says, you know, hon, we've had a wonderful life together. That's the longest sentence I heard in five years. And I said, it was like, everything's okay. This is just a nightmare. I can go home, let's go, we'll watch TV, we're good. And it was, it, she went right back to gibberish after that, but the clearest sentence you could possibly imagine. So to answer that lady's question, there were times when she got, was very lucid and knew some things. And then that gradually just disappeared as in time. So I'm so intrigued. Um, I, I want to ask about caregivers, and I know that's your passion. I want to ask one more quick question about sure. our early onset itself, um, because not knowing, you know, we think of Alzheimer's as an old person's disease. Yes. And yeah, and so the thing that strikes me is that um, they, so you, you explained that somebody had, had at 32 years old and they died or they were 43. So right. what what how what causes the deterioration of their body or what's happening that they die also early as well so they get the, the disease the, yeah the, the brain is is being eaten away by a, a, a protein called beta amyloid it wraps itself around the memory cells and kills them and then it starts to deteriorate the rest of the body the day that common passed away okay the, the, in the nursing facility they called me uh, at my office at about 9 30 10 o'clock in the morning and they said mr Martha, you should get the the um family together 
and come to the facility because we don't think Carmen is going to make it till tomorrow. So I called the kids. One of my daughters, who is a doctor, uh, is in Baltimore. And so she had to drive up in a hurry up to New York. And um, we all got together. We're all in the room holding her hand. And at 9.15, she passed away. So, but all the body organs were failing and that's how they can tell. The liver was going, everything was going. The lungs were collapsing, the heart was very slow. The breathing was just very strained. And that's when you know. So it's basically then that all those functions that we take for granted that our body just does because the brain is slowly being eaten and shutting down that those things right. then just shut down. Right, and then uh, you know they forget to eat. It, mm -hmm. Just they won't eat anything, and they don't. And my wife was adamant about, don't you dare put a tube in me at all. And when I'm on my death, don't try to save me. And I was that do not resuscitate uh, a legal document. Coleman, I think, did that in 1990. <laughs> you know, because she was so strong on that subject. Because there were cases around there were lawsuits going crazy up here in New York. And she said, I'm not going to go through anything like that. Don't you put me through that. And she said, I want that form. And you want to sign one? But I want to sign one with you. And so she had that. And I gave it to the nursing home. So that's what usually happens. There's nothing they can do by law. So um, I'm so grateful that, you're, that you've taken it on to share this information with as many people whose lives that you can touch. I think caregivers, um, I've been lucky, and I, I consider myself very lucky to be involved in a field where uh, in my earlier youth days where I ran into a lot of caregivers. And it's very hard to explain to a caregiver, as you said, that they need to take care of themselves. Yes. And, yes, yes. and it's such an important message. And what would you say is, uh, are, are things that people can do or that they need to realize, or if you know a caregiver who is not taking care of themselves, because that's what we do, we need right. to take care of our loved ones. What should we do for them? Well, that, you know, they, they have to be able to try to seek that help or the family, someone involved close to them has to try to convince them. It's very difficult. And you hope like the man with the heart attack that that doesn't happen. That's not the way to learn. So you really have to try to convince them that, you know, bring a person in, bring a professional caregiver in and say, listen, I just want you to meet this lady. She's very nice. She can sit with Martha and she'll be a good person for her to sit with. They can hang out together and you can go and play golf, you know? That's what we're really trying to get a break here as the caregiver. If a woman is a caregiver, maybe for three, four rounds, she'd like to get her hair done, get a manicure, pedicure, and do nice womanly things and that she would love to do on, that she did normally. That break is huge. That gives them just that extra breather. Then they come in and jump into the fight again. So that's what really has to happen. You have to try to slowly introduce a caregiver saying, I just want to invite this woman over for you to meet her. You know, It's a tough trip though, to, to break that through that wall. And the other thing that's happening today is that they're using the term dementia, which is fine, but there are a number of dementias. Alzheimer's is just one of them. And I, and I see you know, some famous people, baseball players, one of the Mets, dementia. Well, which one? You know, is it Alzheimer's? Is it vascular? Is it uh, Lewy body's disease, which a lot of people don't know that um, Robin Williams, uh, was, uh, he committed suicide and he, was, he suffered from depression. But in the final analysis, they found out that he had Lewy body disease, which is a form of dementia. And what characterizes that is hallucinations, maddening hallucinations. So he was dealing with the depression plus these hallucinations, knew he'd never step on a stage again. And that was all connected to the, the suicide. And I, I agree that there's so many, um, we use that term dementia as a huge umbrella for just kind of any memory, anything. Yes. And, and it seems like that is not as serving to the community and especially the people that are suffering because it doesn't really inform the rest of us what that means. Right, and, and of course there's you know funding that takes place with all these things and making sure, um, and I, I tell this to caregivers all the time, if you have gone through this kind of situation uh, like I did or even with an elderly person uh, and they get pneumonia, did they really die from pneumonia? They died from Alzheimer's. Make sure that's on the death certificate because that's what gets registered in this country as a case. And when money has to be allocated for different diseases, this is why it becomes important. 
Look at the numbers that we have here. If you put someone died of pneumonia hospital, it doesn't go down as go down as pneumonia. Died of natural causes or something like that. Meanwhile, it was Alzheimer's or wrong or whatever that dementia was. That makes perfect sense. And I don't think you're right. Nobody thinks about that. No. Right. Um, well, uh, we have we have a few more minutes left. I wanted to ask you what um, what resources would you suggest? So we, if, if for the folks that don't live around you that don't have your resources, you as a resource, um, where can caregivers uh, seek the services that they need? Usually the, um, the, the biggest organization is the Alzheimer's Association. They are based in Chicago. That's their main office, but they have offices all throughout the United States. And that's a good place to start with your case, to go in, they'll talk to you. You can make appointments with them. And when, as far as finding a caregiver that might be matching the case that you have for your loved one, they can help match you up with that. So the Alzheimer's Association um, is, is really probably the best place. It's very easy to find, very easy to find. And the Alzheimer's you... is also large as well. I'm sorry, which one? The Alzheimer's Foundation is also a large organization. So. If one's not in the town, the other one should be nearby. Do people have to be actually diagnosed with, with the actual Alzheimer's disease in order to get resources? Do you know? Uh, it, 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 it would have to be because if you go in the Alzheimer's Association, that's what they're going to say. What, where did you get your diagnosis from? And that's what, you know, uh, I, like some of my, my friends, I have a uh, mom is, is elderly and, and maybe she's 90 years old or something. And they said, uh, uh, well, you know, my mom's got Alzheimer's. She, she just can't remember a thing. You know, that don't, don't self-diagnose stuff. That's the worst thing you can do. You don't know that. It could be senility dementia. You know, we're all going to get senility dementia if we don't get anything else. You know, we're just going to age into this thing. That's not a diagnosis. You're not going to get any help from the Alzheimer's Association. They're going to say, we feel bad for your problem, but it's really not our area, you know. So the diagnosis really is a must. I think a, that the... Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. With a neurologist, I think. Right, right, I was gonna say, because when you, uh, people feel like if they have the diagnosis, that gives them the stigma. And so they're afraid to get diagnosed. Of course, you don't, people don't want to admit it, but you yes. don't realize that what you just said is exactly right. If you, But yeah. you need to have that diagnosis so that yes. you can begin to take yeah, advantage of those resources. So yeah, These people are professional sure. people, they'll know what direction to take, but they have to have a diagnosis. Right. Right. Well, um, in just the last couple of minutes, um, I wanted to see where can we where can we see ice cream in the cupboard? Well, right now it's uh, the book is on Amazon. It's uh, print on demand or on uh, Kindle. Um, it's all right now. The the film is on Amazon Prime, which is free for Prime members. Uh, it's also on YouTube, Apple TV, Fandango, iTunes, Google Play, and various on demand channels. So it's available in quite a few different places, and and. Everyone should try to see this film that will change your life. Anything that you thought about Alzheimer's, you're gonna learn a whole new curve here because no other film has covered this the way I have covered it. Not one ounce of Alzheimer's. I'm not saying these are bad movies. They were good. You know, Julianne Moore, one best actress and for her film and that's fine. Not one ounce of early onset violence or the slightest agitation even was even in the film. She lost the cell phone and got a little angry. And, and, uh, and still Alice. Okay, but I got hit with a plate across my face. My friends are getting beat up. You know, that's, that's, where, that's what you need to see. I could have made this a film of total violence, but I just wanted to sprinkle in enough to bring, I wanted you to show how much fall in love with Carmen is what I wanted you to do, like I did. And then let me put this violence in so you said, wait a minute, I, I, I didn't know this. You know, meanwhile, it's every day it's happening. So that's why I did the film the way I did, because I didn't think it was covered properly. Well, that is amazing. And I'm very glad that you did, because I think that it's just like anything else. People don't talk about that piece that's embarrassing, or they feel like they should be able to control their loved one, or that something is wrong with them, that they're not doing a good job. Or I'm sure that all of those different thoughts and feelings and guilt uh, that they must feel and to understand it, there's nothing like knowing that there's other people out there that also either have had that experience or yeah. can have, have some answers or some guidance for you. Yeah. And, and the, the early, the recent memory goes first. The older memory goes last. So I, when Carmen's sister 
got Alzheimer's. And she called up and it was the middle of July. And she says, is Carmen there? And Carmen was already in a nursing home. And I said, no, she went to the store. And of course, she had been stricken with Alzheimer's as well. Oh, and she said, okay, because I, uh, I want to see if she want to come over in the backyard and just build snowmen like we used to do. It had to be 89 degrees out. You know. I said, no, but I'm going to call you back. You know. Okay, great. Thanks, Pat. No, she won't. So sometimes you, when a person reaches back and remembers something from the past, you go, oh, she must be getting better. Not really. You know, that's just the last memory to go. Wow, that's so that's so interesting. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing that's your fun. story. Carmen's story, your love story, it sounds like. I cannot wait to watch it myself. And uh, and we'll be able to spread the word about it as well. And Good. thank you for, for putting all of that. Is there anything else that you would like to say uh, while you're here? No, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about being with you because this is what we're doing. We're now sending this message again. The film is a message, talking to you, um, being exposed to an audience anywhere I can speak. Uh, you know, that's, that's the thing I want to do. And that's what I'm doing. And I feel so complete when I do work with people like yourself and I'm able to talk about Carmen's case. I feel like I did a good job for her today. Oh, I do too. I, that's very touching, Pat. That's so wonderful. And like I said, it's clearly your love story together. And, uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting you and Marlene the other day. And yes. uh, it's, you've been blessed with two love stories in your life. Yes, and yes. Marlene's amazing. amazing. Thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's an amazing thing. Well, thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon okay, you your, and Fun your story. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.